And now is the opportunity, ma'am, to enter a plea of either guilty or not guilty. How would you like to reflect your plea? Your Honor, on behalf of Mrs. Daybell, she enters a not guilty plea to both charges and a request for a pretrial and a jury trial. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. So the news has just come out that uh, Laurie has got uh, nothing against appearing in court with her dearly beloved Chad. But uh, the feeling isn't mutual. Chad, through his lawyer John Pryor, doesn't wish to be tried at the same time as Laurie. That feels like it's another way of saying he doesn't want to be associated with her. Maybe that's not true, um, but you can kind of see from a legal perspective the uh, difficulty from, from John Pryor's perspective. If you look at the body count, um, uh, I don't want to say from Laurie's side, but just basically people close to Laurie that have died, her brother, her f fourth husband, Charles Vello, her third husband, uh, Joseph Ryan, and both of her children. Uh, you know, that's five people. And if you compare that to uh, Chad's wife, Tammy, that, that died, it's, it's sort of five to one. And so Chad sort of may feel he has less explaining to do than Laurie, which I think is accurate. I think that is true. On the other hand, the two bodies are on his property, the, the children's bodies are on his property. So, you know, in a way you could sort of add, um, uh, hypothetically, you could add two bodies to his tally. And that is, um, so it's, it now it becomes three to five, which is a bit closer. And then, of course, the fact that he married um, Laurie sort of also comes into the picture. Now I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the legal aspects to this in a little bit more detail and I'm also going to talk about something that I'm doing on Patreon um, via a social psychologist and a cultural anthropologist uh, that is the Pulitzer Prize winning Ernest Becker and he gives some incredible insights just into some of the aspects that are idiosyncratic to this case and I will talk to you a little bit about that uh, at the end of this uh, episode and I'm also going to just cover a couple of the questions that have come up on Patreon just dealing with the same thing um, and um, I will do that again sort of towards the end of, of this episode. It's not going to be a long episode uh, but before we get to that if you're interested in the Laurie Vallow case um, I will be covering it on YouTube, some of the legal developments. So uh, if you're interested in true crime, high profile cases, please subscribe, like, share, leave a comment and let's get started. So from a distance, it's certainly interesting and kind of ironic that you have this situation where this relatively newly married couple you know, they, they weren't, um, you, know, you know, they were on Hawaii kind of um, declaring it the eternal commitments to one another not that long ago. And, um, you know, I refer to her as Laurie Vallo just because I don't want to legitimize her marriage to Chad. I just kind of want her to be remembered as the wife, the former wife of Charles Vallow. Also, just to differentiate her to some extent from Chad. Um, you know, uh, it's Chad Day Bell and Laurie Vallow as far as I'm concerned. And, um, but the fact is, uh, you know, according to what they did, they got married and, and you know, you know what marriage is um, in sickness and in health. 
in um, uh, for richer for poorer and what about you know um, in court when when one is perhaps the deck the, the cards are stacked more against the one than the other kind of thing and I think if you ask the question is are the cards stacked more against one of these two people than the other and I, I don't think it's a difficult uh, question to answer. I, I think that is so. So, why would Laurie want to go to trial with Chad? Uh, but from a legal perspective, why would she want to do that? Now, there are other cases we've seen where that has happened, such as the Amanda Knox case where she was tried with um, her boyfriend, Raffaele Solicito, and they were both initially convicted, and then they were both acquitted, then they were both uh, convicted again, and then finally acquitted. So you, you're kind of in it together if you are tried. And um, I tend to think that it that it is going to suit the prosecution's case if they are tried together because you're going to have a lot more emphasis on everything. And um, whereas if you kind of break it down, you are sort of fragmenting a case and it is going to be somewhat watered down in terms of a jury, for sure. There would be certain areas where a a a, um, a defense lawyer could argue that that this is not strictly speaking relevant to the client or that you'd have to prove that it was absolutely relevant whereas if you were in court you wouldn't have any of those difficulties but let's look at it from Laurie's perspective i do think that Laurie fancies her chances if she rubs shoulders with chad in court and i don't think chad feels the same because legally speaking um, Chad would have a point. He could plead ignorance. He could say, well, the dead bodies, which is done so far, the dead bodies on his property, um, he doesn't know about it. He, you know, um, maybe Laurie was trying to set him up or maybe it was a property she knew about and had access to or her brother had access to or whatever. And how, how should he know? How should he know what is going on? Um, in, 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 in other words, the defense is probably going to try and shift the burden to the prosecution to say, prove that Chad knew about this, prove that there's some way that, Ch that this is linked to Chad. And I, I don't think that's going to be as hard as maybe some people think. I think that the raccoon story and the text and the timing of the text is going to play a big factor in that. I also think that is also how they located the bodies, which was through that text, through the timing of the text and the content of that text. I'll talk about that at a later date. But the other thing is, he could also plead ignorance to Laurie's reputation um, as, well, how can I put it? Um, Laurie um, had had four husbands before Chad married her. And he, um, you, you could sort of make up the case that Chad just was sort of blissfully unaware. He didn't really know about Laurie's past. And you could basically just plead ignorance on everything. But on the other hand, um, if you think about Laurie being tried in court, you can imagine a prosecutor describing her as similar to a black widow in the sense that, you know, two husbands died around her, one fr from a gunshot. And not only that, her own brother died and her children died. You know, it's, um, it's like death lurks around this particular person. And Charles Vallow would probably want to plead ignorance and just say, well, I, I, I didn't know what was going on in her life. And that would be easy if she wasn't sitting in court with him and their narratives weren't sort of coalescing and they weren't seen kind of as a unit.
Um, as I said earlier, Chad, and I don't want to minimize this. I don't want to say, you know, the fact that that there was only one dead person on Chad's side, Tammy. Um, it's still one too many. I, I don't really like saying only, but I'm just comparing it in the legal sense, the, the number of people. So I do think f from a legal sense, it would make sense for Laurie to associate herself with Chad. She might want to transfer, how can I put it? She might want to transfer uh, her um, responsibilities to him to say, well, she did what he wanted or something like that. Or she might want to um, almost wash herself in Chad's glory and, and say, well, you know, um, in, in two ways. The one way being that that Chad indoctrinated her or fooled her or kind of made her believe certain things. Um, but in another way, you know, I think Chad probably has a, some kind of following um, where, where certain people probably have read his books, have been influenced by him and might be kind of quite um, open to whatever his version is, where I think uh, Laurie is going to have a much harder task. Another possibility is Laurie m might feel that her lawyer isn't going to deliver, that her, her lawyer um, isn't kind of a big gun, if I can put it that way, and that by um, being in court, she can kind of almost piggyback on John Pryor, on his efforts. And I think that is quite a, quite a clever tactic, if that is what she's doing. I do think that um, when you see Chad in court, he kind of comes across as, especially with John Pryor speaking for him, as more innocent. Um, again, for the reasons that I've mentioned. Uh, and because of that, I think from Chad's perspective and from John Pryor's perspective, um, you, you would kind of see why Chad would not want to be associated with Laurie. Um, because he might think that a jury would think of her as as less innocent than he was. And so why be tarred by the same brush, if that makes sense? Now, a lot of people have been speculating about who is the mastermind. Yeah, it's something I covered in a previous episode. Um, and I don't think it's so difficult to see. I think Laurie, Laurie and Chad are different people. Laurie used to be a hairdresser. I think she's quite a simple person, but she's also um, got her beliefs. And she's also, I think, quite a charming woman especially around men I, th I mean I don't think she got married five times um, for nothing I think her not just her looks but her, her charm um, could sort of take her places and you can kind of feel that and, and sense that charm when the policeman comes to her and you hear on the body cam the way she talks to him it's not so much what she says because she kind of digs herself in a hole talking about the insurance and she's actually not that believable but it's how she says it she's friendly she's engaging she's confident and this um, tends to stand it to some extent in good stead especially with men chad seems to be the opposite chad doesn't come across as a very confident leader you certainly when you see him um also, when you hear him speak, he doesn't quite come across as charismatic. But he is an author. He is very detail orientated. He is, uh, I think, quite a strategic thinker in certain ways. Uh, people who write books have got to organize their thinking. And I think in that sense, he was. And But the fact is, you know, she's a hairdresser. He was, he was a grave digger. 
and that is giving you some idea of um, that they are kind of you know simple people average people but they got taken uh, that got sort of they were kind of transported into this um, uh, this religious this intoxicating religious um, uh, feeling which which we have, have referred to as a cult and and uh, you know a, it's a kind of a spiritual way of thinking about the world and that is another word for that just is transference where instead of dealing with the the facts and the realities of the real world you kind of trade out of the world and you say well you're not a person you're a zombie and i'm not actually operating in this world uh, there's there's some other world that is going on that's sort of superimposed or going on in the background and you sort of trade out of this world into a, a, a schema that is another reality and you can then have a different kind of power and different kind of history in that thing and I think um, I think Chad was quite clever in that area I think um, he was able to to uh, convince people and uh, move people in the area of um, another spiritual reality someone on patreon asked you know um, if they decide to try them together is it chad or laurie's decision to make well it it is and it isn't um chad can petition the judge and i think he has already to say that it could be prejudicial and basically they're going to submit the arguments to the judge and the judge will then decide based on what they say i do think that it makes sense to try them together but as i say i do think it would favor the prosecution if that happens it all depends on to what extent john Pryor can convincingly argue that this would be prejudicial to his client because if he can do that and the judge goes ahead you could kind of have a mistrial or or appeal it um, but I think I think um, for many reasons it does make sense you know th these two people are kind of in um, are intertwined in many ways not only are they married not only is the or some of the victims of his wife on his property but there are all sorts of other sort of um, linkages going on you know the, the, the belief systems um, uh, Alex Cox kind of being an interloper between them um, and you know obviously to some extent I think Chad would have wouldn't he have met Laurie's children as well and and then there's also the the double there's almost like the mirror of Laurie's husband dies and then Chad's wife dies and th those may not be um, in a legal sense uh, directly uh, how can I put it directly linked you uh, know in an obvious way but I think in a in a rational way you can see that they are kind of mirror images of one another especially given the timing and the context of the marriage and the disappearance of the children and the whole psychology that they kind of got caught up in the cult psychology and I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm doing a series uh, on understanding Laurie Vallow. It's not so much understanding her as understanding this whole concept of cults and how they work and how they can be dangerous to some extent, but how um, human psychology is kind of wired to be somewhat susceptible to some of these um, uh, I don't want to say beliefs because it, that that's very general, but these kind of dogmas, right? It, it's kind of something that is hardwired into us, and it's it's almost like a flaw in the human design that we um, b believe in, you know, that pigs can fly in the middle of July kind of thing. Um, you see it all the time in true crime. Someone suggests something, and people get very very excited. 
um, whereas more often than not um, th the exciting titillating thing that that is getting your attention isn't true but people like to believe those things are true I in general so when it comes to Ernest Becker he talks quite a lot about transference and I'm not going to talk about it in a lot of detail here except just to to highlight um, one kind of basic thing and I mentioned it a little bit earlier is that when you are giving yourself over to a cult a kind of a new or different or custom made belief system you are transferring your responsibilities your um, life force your perspectives your sense of place into a different reality it is literally transference and the Lori Vella case is full of that kind of thing. It is the transference of a person into a, you know, almost, um, what do you call it, um, the, the crystallizing of a human being into kind of life insurance. That's also kind of transference. And then you get it, or you're supposed to get it. Um, the transference of a person into a zombie and then a dead body that's also kind of a transference and, and all of that is okay under a certain dispensation um, the transference of being married to one person and to another but in the most basic way it is the the dogma that you are now transferring into and and as a result all the other realities shift if that makes sense so if you just look at the meaning of the word it means the action of transferring something or the process of being transferred and a lot of what was going on with Laurie and Chad was they were kind of appointing themselves gods on earth that, that's a big kind of transference I'm not a hairdresser I'm a god I'm not a grave digger I'm a deity I'm not an author I am um, Mephistopheles or whatever in psychoanalysis transference is about the redirection to a substitute now you can also see transference from the perspective of Laurie being told by another person that she's, you know, in a former life that she was married to Chad and now there's another kind of transference there. It's like you see another reality for yourself. In other words, you might be stuck in a either a loveless marriage or a, a marriage where there's a lot of debt or just the humdrum of a marriage and now you want to transfer out of that to something more exciting where you're a more powerful figure and where you have more social power in this new reality and it's it's transference and it has to do with you know you might have emotions that were originally felt in childhood right um, and there's there's something called transference neurosis and if you think about what has happened in Laurie's life for example you know that she's gotten divorced four times well yeah four times um, she, and, and you kind of probably had the same thing in the Watts case where Shanann had been divorced before she didn't want to get divorced again um, and also Chris Watts trying to procure a divorce and trying to go from being married to being with somebody else there's kind of a neurosis um, that is associated with that don't you think so when we talk about transference neurosis we kind of talking about chronic distress that is associated with a particular kind of transference such as getting divorced now you don't want to get divorced in a conventional way bec and, and you've got a lot of stress related to that and you can kind of see how this applies in a very basic way that while there are the perks of transference there's also neurosis where you are really worried about certain 
obligations and, and you're so worried that you are either going to try to escape them, transcend them in some way, or, you, or you're going to try to almost like commit a crime to make sure that you don't need to, um, you know, do what you need to do otherwise, like other normal people. Okay, that's about 25 minutes. I'm not going to take it further than that. For those interested in the Watts case on the Patreon channel, I'm doing a series on Cindy Watts, also a series going through that 70 minute interview that Jeremy Lindstrom gave, just sort of looking at what he spoke about. We've just uncovered some interesting detail about um, a phone call that Jeremy heard when he was at the house and we were trying to establish who that could be by cross-referencing it with the discovery. Uh, that, that's definitely been quite an interesting little um, side note in, in the whole you know investigation of the Watts case. Um, I did a live last Sunday. On the 20th, which is the next Sunday, I'm going to be doing a group chat on a, uh, a series which I think aired in, in, in Britain, in the UK, uh, called Deadwater Fell, and it just has so many um, parallels to the Watts case. So we're just going to be chatting about that, and that'll be that discussion will be on Patreon, and, and of course I'll also be analyzing the Netflix movie or the Netflix documentary about Chris Watts on the 30th of September. That'll also be on Patreon. So for those interested, go and check that out. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.